state of shock is not just what happens to us when something bad happens. It's what happens to us when we lose our narrative, when we lose our story, when, when we become disoriented. What keeps us oriented and alert and out of shock is our history. So a period of crisis like the one we're in is a very good time to think about history, to think about continuities, to think about roots. It's a good time to place ourselves in the longer human story of struggle. The story begins on June the 1st, 1951, when representatives of Western intelligence agencies secretly met with academics at Montreal's Ritz-Carlton Hotel. This meeting contributed to military-funded research into the effects of sensory deprivation at McGill University. Sensory deprivation really is a way of producing extreme monotony. It causes a uh, loss of critical capacity, the thinking is less clear, the uh, subject complains that he can't even daydream. When, and when you have college students that can't daydream, you're, they're in a bad way. I began to think while we were doing our experiments that it's possible that uh, something that involves physical discomfort or even pain might be more tolerable than simply the, the deprivation conditions that we studied. Hebb decided to stop work on the research. I had no idea when I suggested that what a, what a vicious weapon, potentially vicious weapon, this could, this could be. These are the days and hours are the occasion. But experiments at McGill continued under the ambitious head of psychiatry, Dr. Ewan Cameron. What he did was much more than what we had done. We did our work strictly with the understanding that the subject could get up and walk out at any point he, he wished to, and some of them did. Cameron's patients were not so lucky. The Allen Memorial Institute, where he worked, began to resemble a macabre prison, where Cameron performed bizarre experiments on his psychiatric patients. Cameron wanted to de-pattern or wipe clean his patient's mind, so he could rebuild them from a blank slate. Janine Huard was a young mother of four, suffering from postnatal depression. I used to shiver when they told me about you're going to get a shock treatment tomorrow. I used to shiver. I was so scared of it. And I would wake up in another room, all, all uh, mixed up and sad, and it used to make me very sad after. You're just like a zombie walking around. Cameron combined shock therapy with sleep therapy and the repeated playing of taped messages. It says, uh, Janine, Janine, you are running away from your responsibility. You don't want to take care of your husband and children. All the time, the same thing. It sounds like you were being interrogated. Yes, interrogation, but... For what purpose? It wasn't long before the CIA put Cameron's research into practice. Many of his techniques appear in the agency's Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual. These words are from the manual. It's a fundamental hypothesis of this handbook that these techniques are in essence methods of inducing regression of the personality. There is an interval, which may be extremely brief, of suspended animation, a kind of psychological shock or paralysis. Experienced interrogators recognize this effect when it appears and know that at this moment the source is far more open to suggestion, far likelier to comply than he was just before he experienced the shock. At the same time as Ewan Cameron was conducting his experiments in Montreal, an exponent of another kind of shock was working not so far away. Milton Friedman was teaching economics at the University of Chicago. 
He believed economic shock therapy could encourage societies to accept a purer form of deregulated capitalism. In October 2008, in the midst of the biggest financial crisis since 1929, Naomi Klein went to the University of Chicago to talk about Milton Friedman. When Milton Friedman turned 90, the Bush White House held a birthday party for him. And everyone made speeches, including George Bush. But there was a really good speech that was given by Donald Rumsfeld. My favorite quote in that speech from Rumsfeld is this. He said, Milton is the embodiment of the truth that ideas have consequences. What I want to argue here is that the economic chaos that we're seeing right now on Wall Street and on Main Street and in Washington stems from many factors, of course, but among them are the ideas of Milton Friedman. The Wall Street crash of 1929 led to the depression of the 30s. Central to Friedman's thesis was his opposition to the New Deal announced by President Franklin Roosevelt in his inaugural speech. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Influenced by the economist John Maynard Keynes, Roosevelt started a program of public employment to get people back to work. Today, depression is a fading memory. Millions of men and women have found employment, and with it, confidence and hope. It wasn't that simple. The depression lasted into World War II. But after the war, the Marshall Plan spread Keynes's model of government regulation and intervention to Europe. His principles were widely accepted, but not in the economics department of the University of Chicago. Milton Friedman from this university waged a war against the New Deal. Friedman was a member of a group called the Mont Pelerin Society, led by the Austrian economist Friedrich von Hayek. They believed that if governments stopped providing services and stopped regulating markets, the economy would correct itself. In the 50s, they were seen as cranks, but over the last 30 years, their ideas have become the dominant economic doctrine. The thesis of the shock doctrine is that we've been sold a fairy tale about how these radical policies have swept the globe. That they haven't swept the globe on the backs of freedom and democracy, but they have needed shocks, they have needed crises, they have needed states of emergencies. Milton Friedman understood the utility of crisis. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. It was in Chile that Friedman's disciples first learned how to exploit a large-scale shock or crisis. Usually the official storytellers of neoliberalism, the official publicists, don't even mention Chile. They start the story with Thatcher and Reagan because it's much more flattering that way. In the 50s and 60s, Chile's progressive developmental policies were a beacon in the region. The governments invested in health, education and industry. American corporations were worried their investments would suffer. In response, the U.S. State Department began sponsoring students from Chile and the rest of South America to study free market economics with Milton Friedman. The University of Chicago had a joint arrangement with the Catholic University of Chile under which a great many Chilean students came to the University of Chicago, were trained by us and received PhDs. These students went back and taught in Chile. The Catholic University Economics Department in Santiago became a little Chicago school. Arnold Harberger, the economist in charge of the program, described himself as a seriously dedicated missionary. In 1970, 
Salvador Allende's popular unity government won the election on a platform of nationalization of large sectors of the economy. Chile's phone company was majority owned by the US corporation ITT. It spearheaded attempts to stop Allende becoming president. It had the support of Richard Nixon in the White House. I was not there, but I can uh, uh, tell you what we now know to be a fact. He uh, ordered the CIA to, to prevent Allende from assuming the presidency. And indeed, they tried to get me to lean on the Chilean military right after Allende was elected. Despite the efforts of the CIA, Allende was sworn in as president. Richard Nixon ordered the CIA director to make the economy scream. Señor Nixon es presidente de Estados Unidos. Yo soy presidente de Chile. Yo no tendré un término despectivo contra el señor Nixon mientras el señor Nixon respete al presidente de Chile. Preparations began for the military coup. The Chilean Chicago boys started work on a 500-page economic blueprint called the BRIC. With U.S. funding. Everything was done to destabilize the economy. Truck drivers went on strike, bringing factories and shops to a standstill. There was a failed coup attempt on June the 29th, 1973. And then on September the 11th, with General Pinochet leading the army, the assault began on the presidential palace. Chile had enjoyed 41 years of uninterrupted, peaceful, democratic rule. Now it was being violently overthrown. Pinochet and his supporters described the coup as a war. It was certainly designed to look like one. It was a Chilean precursor to shock and awe. armadas y de orden solo bajo la inspiración patriótica de sacar al país del caos que en forma aguda lo estaba precipitando el gobierno marxista de Salvador Allende. The Chicago boys delivered their economic blueprint, the brick, to Pinochet. <tose> days that followed, more than 13,000 opponents were arrested and imprisoned. Thousands of prisoners were held in the national stadium. Many were tortured. Chile became notorious around the world. ¿Cuántas personas? At the beginning of November, 5,000 prisoners were released. The 900 they left behind were transferred to other detention centers.
less than a month later, FIFA allowed Chile to play a World Cup qualifier in the very same stadium. Their opponents, the Soviet Union, refused to play there, so Chile were allowed to score into an open goal and went through to the 1974 World Cup finals. With the population in shock, Pinochet imposed the policies recommended by the Chicago boys. Removal of price controls, the sale of state companies, the removal of import barriers and cuts to government expenditure. Friedman later openly acknowledged the importance of the Chilean experiment. Here was the first case in which you had a movement toward communism, which was replaced by a movement toward free markets. It didn't work. A year later, inflation was 375% per year, the highest in the world. So in March 1975, Arnold Harberger and Milton Friedman flew into Santiago. He used a phrase that had never before been used in a real-world economic crisis. He called for shock treatment. He said that he was like a doctor that was going to help a country that was suffering an epidemic, and he was simply prescribing the medicine. Friedman wrote that General Pinochet was sympathetically attracted to the idea of a shock treatment, but was clearly distressed at the temporary unemployment it might cause. It rapidly became clear that Friedman's economic policies benefited the wealthy at the expense of the poor. It was calculated that a family trying to live on the average wage had to spend 74% of its income on bread. Items such as bus fares or milk became luxuries, and Pinochet got rid of free milk in school, a move that echoed the controversial policy of the young education minister in Britain, who would later become his friend. In order to enforce these economic policies, there had to be an enemy to fear. Tampoco le digo que se haya triunfado totalmente sobre el marxismo. El marxismo es como un fantasma. Cuesta mucho tomarlo. Mejor dicho, no se puede tomar. Friedman and Harberger argued that free market economics went hand in hand with freedom and democracy. But in Chile, where their ideas were being implemented within the context of a military dictatorship, the opposite was true. Many in Latin America saw a direct connection between the economic shocks that impoverished millions of people and the epidemic of torture inflicted on those who believed in a different kind of society. One of those was Orlando Letelier. Letelier had been Allende's ambassador in Washington. He spent a year in one of Pinochet's prisons before being exiled back to America. In 1976, Letelier wrote, the economic plan has had to be enforced and in the Chilean context, that could only be done by the killing of thousands, the establishment of concentration camps all over the country and the jailing of more than 100,000 persons in three years. Less than a month later, Letelier was killed by a car bomb. Good evening. A powerful bomb today tore through a car as it was driving along Washington's usually quiet Embassy Row. The Chilean was Orlando Letelier, who also had been foreign minister during the last months of the late Salvador Allende's Marxist regime. Richard Roth reports. Michael Townley, a member of Pinochet's secret police, was behind the bombing. He'd entered the U.S. on a false passport with the knowledge of the CIA. Michael, buenas noches. Buenas noches, Pablo. La opinión del Poder Judicial chileno, ¿hay confianza en él? Mire, yo 
confío plenamente en la, en la justicia chilena como patriota y luchador antimarxista y juntista por sobre todas las cosas. Despite his confidence, Townley was extradited to the U.S. and convicted of Letelier's murder. Pinochet ruled Chile as a military dictator for 17 years, but in a frank interview, Harberger remained in denial. You cannot have a repressive government for long within a genuinely free economic system. In the same year as Orlando Letelier's murder, Milton Friedman was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics. I don't, you know, you people have such a distorted idea of what went on. Let me tell you some facts. Number one, I was offered two honorary degrees by universities in Chile before I went down. I refused to take them because those universities were being supported in part by public funds and I did not want to appear in any way to provide any support to the political system in Chile. I'm not a representative of Chile. I'm not an advisor to Chile. I have no commitments to the government of Chile. I now turn to you, Professor Milton Friedman. I am very sorry for this incident. It could have been worse. <laughs> What I'm trying to do in the shock doctrine is tell an alternative history of how this savage stream of pure capitalism that we've been living, capitalism unrestrained, came to dominate the world. Chile wasn't the only country in South America to adopt Chicago school policies. Friedman's disciples held key positions in Brazil and advised the government of Uruguay. Then on March the 24th, 1976, a military coup overturned the government of Isabel Perón in Argentina. A junta of three generals took over the country, led by General Videla. Yo. Chicago boys landed key economic posts in the military government. They seized the opportunity for major economic and social re-engineering. And within a year of the coup, wages lost 40% of their value, factories closed, poverty spiraled. Just as in Chile, people had to be terrorized into accepting these economic policies. Videla learned from Pinochet's experience. He adopted the tactic of disappearing people, striking a balance between public and private